as opposed to playing the role of one. The last time I was in this very hall was about 20 years ago. I was playing the role of Portia in The Merchant of Venice. It was one of those very rushed, chaotic school productions and nobody knew their lines. So that day we had to get really innovative with Shakespeare. Last year I met a British actor at a theatre workshop, Emily Minton, and speaking to her she said about Shakespeare, he's just another writer in the English language. His work is not carved in stone, it's not the Bible. So if you want to change some words so that a play works better for Sri Lanka, we can do that. So all the way back then in school, we were all really upset at that awful performance right here on this stage. I mean, actually, we were quite ahead of the curve and already innovating Shakespeare. Much to the displeasure and horror of our teacher that day. So today we're here speaking about innovation. And being a lawyer, generally innovation is quite far away from us and what we do. And for me, innovation brings to mind all kind of sparkly, fancy gadgets that can do amazing things like uh, self-driven cars and robot vacuum cleaners. But then I got thinking, I don't really think and believe that we need to be a scientist or a genius to be able to innovate. I think we all can. These are the daily innovations that we can all make and must in our daily lives. We all have the power to innovate ourselves. In the legal profession, for most of us, um, everything begins with definitions. They're safe, they're familiar, and they set a framework within which we can work. So looking at the Webster's Dictionary, it refers to innovation as a new idea, method, or device, and the act or process of introducing this new method, idea, device. And it made it all sound like innovation was only for scientists and engineers, leaving the rest of us, like lawyers, very much out of it. But is innovation only for the techie people? I don't think so. Because another definition that I quite like about innovation is that it is to change something that is not working for us by introducing a new idea, a method, or even a product. And if we just shelve the products for a moment, surely all of us can introduce a new idea or method into everything we do every day. So this is innovation as change, not change for the sake of it, but change to make things better, especially if what is already established is not working for us, our families, and our community. I believe that this too is innovation, and that is something that is accessible to all of us. Albert Einstein is have said to have very famously said that doing the same thing over and over again and then expecting a different result is insanity. Repeating patterns mindlessly is like to be a mouse in a maze or a hamster going around on a wheel. Ask yourselves, where in your day you find these signs of madness? I know for me, in the last 18 months, I have sprained an ankle three times. Third time round, I know the drill. I'm in agony for days. I can't walk. It's really frustrating. And then I can't swim or go to the gym or do yoga for uh, four weeks. I can't wear high heels for six. So the third time round, I'm there lying on the bed with my legs up against the wall. And I had to ask myself, why does this keep happening? Now I just keep in mind to warm up. But in general, lawyers love questions. I love questions. In my day, there'll be so many questions I have to ask to get to the bottom of a legal issue. It's always what happened before, what's happening now, uh, why do we have to do this? It gets pretty Sherlock Holmes, FCID, really. And then the clients and the colleagues start getting really irritated because they're not fans of the questions because most of the time the answers are possibly truths that they're not ready to face. Once I had 
a client who came to me in a mighty huff and he insisted on suing uh, one of his suppliers because the generator the supplier had fixed in his factory was not working. So I got ready to investigate, had all my juicy lawyer questions lined up. And then three questions later, the client says, oh, but we hadn't put diesel in the generator. <laughs> Obviously, we didn't sue the supplier. But you realize that asking questions and getting the answers helps me as a lawyer to make sure that my clients don't get involved in absolutely idiotic lawsuits, which is going to cost them a lot of money. So the answers help me to figure out what needs to be done to protect the client's money and mostly make sure they don't go off their heads. So to really be able to do more and be more and achieve the goals that we really want to, we have to become our own investigators. We have to ask ourselves the difficult questions and from those around us. This is the first and most difficult question and most challenging thing when it comes to innovating yourself. I mean, as children, we're always asking questions. It can be ridiculous, it can be simple, it can be complex, we don't really care. But then as we start getting older, the questions reduce and we just start accepting things because we want friends and family to like us and to fit in. Nobody likes to be excluded. How often do we actually question others? In our society, do we ever think to ask why criminal acts are excused in the name of tradition and bonding? Take ragging, for example. What if one student or one batch made the choice to question and challenge this mentality that if it happened to us, we have to do it to others? Maybe the victimization and abuse will end. The first day I went to Colombo University, I walked into the arts faculty alone. Being from Candy, I didn't have friends to go along with me and hold my hand. I was determined I was not going to tolerate ragging. And I was lucky I didn't have to. But I know friends who've left university recently and they have had to endure people shouting at them in filth for hours, having sand kicked into their lunch boxes, and even more disgustingly, gender-related violence and abuse. And this is not the worst of it. Murder, gender-related gender violence, suicide rates due to ragging have increased in Sri Lanka in the last 40 years based on UGC statistics. This reminds, brings to mind, rather, the story of the monkeys and the Topi Velenda. Some of you may remember that. The, and then I wonder, why are the cream of Sri Lankan youth, the supposedly smartest, behaving like monkeys? Monkey see, monkey do. So the Topi Velenda got his hats back because the monkeys mimicked him and just threw it down from the tree. Similarly, in society, abuse tends to just continue when previous patterns are mimicked and not questioned in any way. It happens at home, it happens in public. Simple things like a kid who doesn't want to be a doctor being forced to study and do those horrible medical exams. And what women have to tolerate on the roads, I mean the unwelcome leering where you have to listen to, ah, Nangi, Hello, sexy. <laughs> Innovation is, is a choice. A choice to take action, to change something that's not working for you and those around you. Wouldn't an innovation of this nature be better than the latest upgrade to your phone or some new gadget or app? We really need to keep asking the questions. There are no stupid questions. Not to ask questions is stupid. And I think as Sri Lankans, at some point, we all need to ask the question. We have Anuradhapura and Sigiriya, as was spoken about before, these great eras of hydraulic innovation in our history. And today, 2,000 years later, we can't even figure out how to stop the Kalani River from flooding. So where has it all gone wrong for us? If we don't like where we are now, then we need to ask the questions. 
we have to question the status quo. When I was growing up in Kandy, it was a dreamy place. We didn't have social media, no internet. I used to pour over National Geographic magazines and the Newsweek, and I really wanted to be this award-winning journalist who could save the world. But then most of the time I realized as a kid, the questions I asked kept getting me into trouble. I would ask my mom, why can't I go somewhere alone? And then I'd be like, why do I have to pray in a language I can't understand? And most of the time I just, you know, didn't get many answers, but scoldings. And as time progressed, the scoldings became judgments. And they were kind of like, uh, good girls are only seen and not heard. Ah, uh, shame, shame, and my all-time favorite one, my God, what will people say? <laughs> By this time, I was, I was too tired of thinking about saving the world. I just wanted the people around me to like me. And as a friend of mine from university says, uh, I copped out. I gave up on being myself because I wanted to please everyone else. And uh, <laughs> I'm someone who loves being in the water and swimming. Uh, and <laughs> during my... Law, uh, university time, uh, my religiously well-matched boyfriend of the time said that I should not swim in a law medical swimming meet because swimming and showing my legs to other people is not what good girls from this community do. By that time, I had just given up wanting to challenge anything or question anything. My spirit had withered and wilted and I just gave in to what anyone else wanted. And I wanted to keep the peace externally. But internally, I realized that I was starting to get, was it agitated or maybe even resentment building up because I realized that my curiosity had died. I had let myself down and basically broken my own heart in the process. So as a people-pleasing adult, I used to subscribe to a daily quotation that came into my inbox. I think I was desperately clutching at the words of others because I had lost my own voice. And I remember reading the words, he who finds himself loses his misery by Matthew Arnold, an English poet. And that day, looking at those words, I realized I was lost. I had no one else to blame but myself. And then the glimmer of a question started kind of creeping out and was asking, do you have what it takes to save yourself? Can you change what is not working for you? Change brings with it a fear of the unknown. Uh, it takes a lot of effort and commitment. And also, I think a lot of the time we say, um, I can't be bothered, I'm too lazy. Uh, what change is because of this fear. Fear of failure, fear of not being accepted, fear of people laughing at us. So then what do you do? Do you let the fear suck the life out of you and just wither away? Or you can start getting curious. You can start asking the questions again. For me, I realized the fear was because I was afraid if I innovated myself, changed what was not working, that the people around me wouldn't accept me. But I realized my fears were unfounded. The um, people around me continued to accept me. And more importantly, I rediscovered the person who wanted to save the world, except that now, instead of saving the world, I had to start with saving myself. So I got back into the pool and the sea, and 10 years later, I successfully completed an international Ironman 5150 triathlon. In the journey of the mythic hero, he leaves the safety of his home, has to brave uncharted territories, slay the dragons, learn new lessons, and then bring the message home. We mustn't succumb to this Lankan pastime of balagana innava, or waiting for someone else to come and save us. We need to be our own heroes. If something is not working, instead of blaming the education system or our parents, we need to start making it happen. And we don't need to look too far for inspiration. I think Kumar Sangakkara, as someone spoke about him, uh, Kumar Sangakkara, whose name is actually here on the board as a ride medalist winner. Um, he was known as a senior around Candy at the time who played tennis. But then he changed something. And today we know him as the, one of the greatest batsmen in the world. And Muttaya Murilidharan started off as an opening batsman and fast bowler, shifted to bowling off spin. And because of this shift, 
the world was able to witness its greatest ever wicket taker. Both of these heroes started life and the fostering of their innovative spirits right here in Kandy. Choose to ask the difficult questions. Choose to take action and create space in your heart for that, those difficult moments of innovation. Life is actually like an agreement. An agreement between who you want to be and who you are right now. The terms of that agreement are defined by you. Thank you.